you know, the road to entrepreneurial success, it's never, and you'll hear this often when you talk to people that have been in business for a while, it's never a linear straight line. All right, Andy, we are now live. Welcome to the Amazing Freedom Podcast. How are you doing? Good, good. All right, well, uh, kick us off. I'm excited to hear about um, some bad memories that you're going to bring up for us again. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the road to entrepreneurial success, it's never, and you'll hear this often when you talk to people that have been in business for a while, it's never a linear straight line. If you've seen those charts before, it's often wiggly. You know, you shoot up a little bit, you have success, then you go down a little bit because you experience failure, then you shoot up a little higher because you have success. So that's kind of what it's like when you first start selling on Amazon, as well as when you first start building brands on Amazon. And so early on in our career, this was like 2014, it was still basically the wild, wild west on the Amazon.com marketplace. So it was still relatively new. You could throw items on there very easily. You could do giveaways, which would get you reviews. It was all kosher with Amazon TOS. And so we were launching a number of products, Nate. We were throwing things like silicone spatula sets. You were throwing things like uh, these bags that you could put luggage in or uh, basically storage bags, space, right? And then you space would, bags, they were yeah, called. Yes, space bags. And you, you, you vacuumed out the air. Yeah. And so, you know, these huge volume of blankets, you know, suddenly are like the size of a napkin. So we are throwing all these type of products. Well, we came across a niche where we saw there was a ton of opportunity. There was photo booth props. So there were a few really larger sellers on Amazon that were absolutely crushing it. We're talking ranks of like a thousand, two thousand in toys. A lot of times it was based around holidays. So you had like Christmas, you had Valentine's, but then you also had evergreen ones like like birthday or anniversary photo booth props. And that was then, again, if you remember back in the uh, mid-2015, 2014, Whatever party you went to generally had a photo booth, right? And so if you had a photo booth, you had to have photo booth props. Well, on Amazon, they're absolutely crushing it. So we saw that. We identified the niche. We then went to Alibaba, which is typically how we did things back then. We still do, do it that way today. And on Alibaba, we saw, you know, these amazing designs of photo booth props uh, that were just really well done, right? The artistic uh, nature of them. And they were like wicked low price. So we saw it on Alibaba. We saw it on Amazon. We were like, oh man, that's a no brainer. The margin there is massive. These things are really little, so they're easy to ship. So boom, we place an order. I believe we place about seven or $8,000 worth right on the initial order. So they, they shipped to us. I think we air shipped them as well. Uh, because the margin was so massive, we create the listings, we get them on Amazon. I think we did four versions, so it was four separate listings. And as soon as they get into Amazon, boom, they start selling right right away. Very similar to uh, if you've listened to our story before about the inflatables that we sold. And you know, then they start to they got down to like four thousand, five thousand Reagan toys. And it's one of those similar feelings where you're like, oh man, you're a hero. You're going to be a multimillionaire. We've discovered a niche. And not only that, now we can build out right into all these other evergreen birthdays and anniversaries and Valentine's. And then about two weeks in, we get the dreaded, the listing has been deactivated and we get a letter from a large company, probably the largest seller, not only on Amazon, but just nationwide of photo booth props, saying that we were copying their design patent. And, uh, and so we looked into it. Actually, it wasn't design patent. What, what, what is the, Is it a trademark, Nate? It was just their design. So they, you know, whenever you create your own unique design by default, uh, you get the rights to that design. So you technically don't even have to patent it if it's a unique piece of artwork that you've personally created. And so uh, that's the intricacies of U.S. kind of copyright and trademark that's different around the world. But at least in the U.S., if you design an art, 
artwork piece yourself, you really don't even have to do anything else. If somebody else copies it exactly, uh, you you can go after them. Now, if somebody changes it slightly, uh, there's a lot. Th then it's usually okay. Like you just have to make it a little bit different. But if it's exactly the same, someone else made it, somebody else created it themselves. Uh, you're infringing on their copyright or their yeah their copyrighted material. Yeah. So again, if you're listening to this, this is a really great learning lesson for you. Don't do what we did. You want to dig in deeper, do your research, because just like Nate just said there, there are artwork designs that you, if you use the same one as another seller and they're selling it prior, you, you then have to remove your listing. All that inventory is basically garbage. And that's what happened to us. We lost probably between six and $7,000 during that photo booth prop experience. So we often, again, tell sellers, don't think that you can just go to Alibaba and see whatever they're selling there and then think that you can sell on Amazon. You do have to do a little bit of more due diligence to make sure that you are going to have the ability and the right to be able to sell that product. Correct, Nate? Yeah, that's right. And so um, really, you know, not to scare anyone away because there's so many, you know, obviously opportunities out there. But if, if you're looking at a product that has a unique piece of artwork, just make sure, like Andy said, that you can actually use that, that someone else didn't create that that's other than the manufacturer themselves that's giving you the rights. Or better yet, just see if you can come up with your own unique piece of artwork that then you can own the rights to that. That would be my recommendation if we were to do that again. Yeah, absolutely. So again, that's free advice. Learn from our pain. Uh, don't do what we did. Make sure if you're using any type of artwork that just like you said, you got to research Amazon really well. And then if it has to, it's much better if you create a different version than what's already selling on Amazon. All right. Well, welcome back to the Amazing Freedom Podcast. My name is Nate Slammons, joined by Andy Slammons, as always. And today we're going to be talking about what your margins or what our margins should look like as an Amazon brand in 2022. It's, it kind of changes all the time a little bit, but best practices typically stay the same in business from year to year. And so we'll, we'll talk about what we're seeing in our brand and what we see the best Amazon brands doing right now. I want to remind everybody who's listening to head over to amazingfreedom.com and sign up to be an insider. I'm actually really excited. We just released our first ever Amazing Freedom Magazine, the January 2022 edition is on the website. If you're an insider, you should have got a notification of that. Andy, give me your thoughts. You didn't see much of the magazine until it was basically finished. So, um, uh, you know, I, I worked on it some, but Absalom on our team really took the lead on that with our designers and, and our content team. So you kind of saw the finished project. Uh, what product, what was your initial thought when you saw it? I was blown away. So being in the Amazon seller space now for nine years, and there's a number of different companies and agencies that put out content. I honestly think that magazine that our team put together is the most creative uh, image, uh, just visually, uh, you know, just uh, appealing that I've seen in the last nine years. So super excited to be able to get that out to folks who are selling on Amazon. Again, if you're not an insider, I highly encourage you to go there. And there's some really good content that we're putting in that magazine that nobody else that I've seen is doing. We actually kind of peel back the onion on our $10 million brand, and we're doing a monthly blog post that is giving you some really inside information and details on strategies that we're taking that I think is going to be super helpful in helping Amazon sellers move forward in their business as they grow to 10 million. Yeah, so we're a little bit biased, obviously, on, on how good we think it is. But Andy, you know, you always wanted to be on a magazine cover. You just haven't been yet. So we decided just to create our own and, and get it out of the way, right? So well, uh, yeah. and I, I'm sorry, I'll say this too. Like, I mean, it's amazing. Our team, we work with a number of brands as well. So we have some phenomenal uh, creative artists that work with imagery as well as copy on the listings, you know, of the multi-million dollar brands that we work with. And this is the first time that we've asked them to help us put out great 
content for Amazon sellers as they grow their business. And I think they knocked it out of the ballpark. But I think a lot of that has been built on the last three years of experience our team has had, you know, making great content in Amazon listings and imagery. Well, hopefully we've piqued the interest of anybody listening to this to at least check it out. That's at amazingfreedom.com. You can see both the January magazine that we released and you can see our January 2022 numbers. That's all part of our $10 million challenge that we're doing this year. So Andy and I have challenged ourselves to get to $10 million in our largest Amazon brand. And instead of just doing it quietly, like we have in the past, we're putting ourselves out there and doing it publicly by actually publishing those numbers at the end of the month, which is definitely scary. And we've said from the beginning, uh, just because we've hit this number before doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And in the January 2022 update, we talk about some major headaches. Uh, I won't go through all the details now, but some of our best products getting taken down, um, some black hat dirty tactics of competitors coming after us. So you get to hear about all that in that January update. You get to see what we did uh, land out. We were short of our initial goal for January, but still have high hopes for the year. So check that out, become an insider, and then you'll get automatically notified of that. And you'll be able to see that update as part of our $10 million challenge every month. And you'll get to see those magazines. And I'm, I'm looking forward to those future magazines, seeing who else is on the cover uh, besides just us. We had to be on the first cover, but see else, who else is on there. Uh, it's going to be really exciting. All right. Well, today, Andy, we want to talk about margins, uh, profit, at the bum, end of the bum, day, bum. at the the dollars at the end of the day, right? What is what is the saying uh, that we always say that um, revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king, right? And so today we're talking about that profit. That's so money much, in the bank is fact. It, your money in the bank is fact. That's right. You got to finish it out. So uh, we're not going to be talking about the money in the bank or the cash so much. We're going to land at the profit, the sanity part, and talk about what the numbers of an Amazon brand should be or approximately. Uh, and I was really, I really liked the LinkedIn post that you found. Uh, I can't, I can't remember when a couple of weeks ago. Do you have that in front of you? Because I thought that was valuable to read through that LinkedIn post, and then we'll give our insights. The post actually wasn't about Amazon brand specifically. It was more on D to C brands and what this person was seeing. Uh, but then we'll take that and we'll say, okay, as an Amazon brand, what are we seeing, and, and what do we see the best brands who are exiting or selling their business landing at? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just preface it with this too. This is not a sexy topic. You know, the sexy part of brand building is when you're sourcing, you find that new product and when you market it, right. And when you put it on Amazon, the unsexy side of business in general is the accounting dealing with the numbers. However, right. That's the foundation. If you don't have good margins and we've been talking to somebody who actually sold this company for over a hundred million dollars. And he said, num number one thing that he really looked for as he was building his brand was he said, there has to be margin, right? In the product. And I know Nate, that's what you really have been hammering with our team over the last couple of months. How do we get better margin? Yeah, and, and this person you're talking about was really focusing on the gross margin. So when you're doing your sourcing, making sure that you have the gross margin there, basically what you buy the product for, uh, or what you sell the product for minus what you landed the, the, the product for, just looking at that gross margin, not taking into account all the other costs. So that's important, the gross margin. And today we're going to be focusing more on the profit margin, so kind of the bottom line number. And so that's what we'll hit on, all those extra expenses that get tacked on. You know, if, if we could only focus on gross margin all the time, life would be good. But all of a sudden you get all those things in there like marketing, you know, PBC and marketing expense and uh, your employees and your team members and your storage costs and all this stuff that adds up. And it's like, wait a second, I thought, you know, I thought there was a lot more money uh, before all that happened. So that's what we'll talk about is the profit margin. Well, let's, since you started with PPC, let's talk about that because we noticed in our brand in October, November, December, uh, a reduced net profit margin. And so we really started to dig into it and figure out what we could do specifically around PPC, because I think you identified 
our ad spend was ballooning out of control, which was really putting downward pressure on our margin. So to me, that's probably the easiest one that we could start with as far as when you're building a brand on Amazon, you really have to know what you're doing. So what are some things that you did with our team to then begin to increase that margin back up related to our ad spend? Yeah, sure. And I, I don't know if we have that LinkedIn post in front of us. So I'll just kind of, I, I believe it. Sa- this person was saying, hey, the best successful D2C brands are typically looking at like a um, 70 to 80 plus percent gross margin. And then you account for like a 20% marketing expense on that. That brings you down to 50 or 40. Uh, and then when you look at your other general expenses, kind of landing at that 25% margin, the, the most successful D2C brands are, are landing in that 20 to 25 and more the, the really successful ones, 25 plus, usually they have some kind of unique selling proposition and they're a little bit different. Their branding is really on point. And so they can have that higher margin, which, um, you know, as an Amazon seller, 25% margin seems crazy high. It's hard to get there because when you factor in just the Amazon commission, right, of 15%, when you factor in any FBA fees and then these PPC costs we're going to talk about in just a second, it's really, really hard to get there unless you're just selling at a extremely high price compared to what you're buying at. And again, just having a starting with a really, really high gross margin is how you have to do that in order to, to land at that 25% profit margin. So that's what this art, this, this, um, LinkedIn post or article was saying, basically, Hey, these best brands are doing that. Now, again, easier said than done to just say, yeah, the best brands are at 25%. So on Amazon, what are we seeing? The trouble we got into last year was everybody across Amazon that I talked to at all last year, 2021 saw their PPC costs increase through the year. Now there's various factors that went into that. Amazon as a platform specifically were purposefully increasing their PPC costs. I believe like they have gotten to the point of their business now where Amazon, uh, uh, Amazon itself, uh, the the 3PL platform, really wasn't making Amazon a lot of money, right? Up until just recently, and now all of a sudden, you look at their state, their their year end statements they're putting out. All of a sudden, their advertising platform is huge. They're competing now with Google and and Facebook as far as one of the top ad revenue platforms out there, and it's because now. Amazon, when you go there, is plastered with ads and they're finally making a lot of money off of it. You have your SBA ads, you have the whole top of search, you have video ads, uh, there's ads everywhere, right? And and the whole controversy out there, I think there's a, a legal debate going on right now is Amazon basically disguising their sponsored ads too much where customers, as a customer, Amazon shop shopper, you really don't notice the ads on Amazon like you do on some other platforms. And so Amazon has, has done a good job making their ads seem native or organic. And, and so we're seeing that we're seeing our costs go up. So you have Amazon purposely trying to just make more money from the ads, I believe. Then you have the increase in competition from sellers uh, everywhere. Definitely a lot of Chinese sellers coming in in the last two years. And then you have the Amazon kind of aggregators and uh, institution money coming into Amazon, driving up uh, PPC costs because these guys need to generate revenue and, and sell at all costs. And uh, there's a lot of factors going in there. And there's more than just that. And so we saw our PPC costs go up. And so we were averaging between a, a um, 10 and 12% tacos, so total advertising cost of sale. And that's what we like to look at is our tacos more than just our A costs, the general advertising cost of sale. And anybody who's coming into Amazon with a non-Amazon background, I know normally you're looking at your ROAS more on Facebook and Google. Amazon is showing ROAS, making ROAS a bigger deal now. But as a as an old school Amazon sellers, Andy, I know we just think of everything still in a cost. It's really hard to kind of break that, uh, break that. And so sometimes I'll get our ROAS and and do that. But for me, it's still always the a cost of tacos. That's like the Amazon language. So uh, our tacos between ten and twelve percent, and we saw that then creep up to over fifteen percent by the end of the year. And so that's a real three to five percent profit margin reduction essentially that we saw because of our tacos increasing through the year. And so at the end of the year, we we basically said, hey, uh, we're off season for some of our products, but we're keeping our tacos the same. And so that's, that's one point I want to go over is if you are a seasonal brand, you may want to really look at your seasonality and adjust your tacos through, through the year based on the season. If, if you are in season, we plan on actually 
being okay with the higher tacos because that higher tacos is going to just get our brand out there. Uh, the organic sales should kind of compensate for that as well. And, and that should help it when we're off season, we're going to try to purposely reduce our tacos down to a lower level, just because it's, it's harder to generate those sales at that time. So that's one thing we had. Let me give a great example about that. So I was just recently at a trade sale with other Amazon sellers and I was sharing with one of these sellers who is in charge of the PPC for their account. They have a really good private label brand. They have a winner product about how we've reduced ours to under 12%. Well, he then went back and he started to adjust some of his campaigns, but he has a winner product. So it was selling really well. So he turned some campaigns off, right, to try to lower that. But his product's a winner product. And so their sales like shut off almost immediately. And so the owner then called me and said, hey, did you talk with them? And I said, yeah, I was sharing with them. He's like, oh, man. So he had to go back and say, no, look, this is our prime selling season. We want to be everywhere because that's going to lead to increased sales. And that's when customers are specifically looking for this product. So he did. <laughs> so you were giving bad advice, basically, and got scolded. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, this is how we do it. <laughs> right. You were, th that's like you needed your um, financial disclosure, like all advice is, you know, take, take it at your own risk. Uh, yeah, so exactly. And and obviously, tacos is supposed to stay pretty consistent, but I think the seasonality there, there's a reason most people are spending more in Q4 if, if you have Q4 products, right? So that was one takeaway. Another takeaway is typically in the past when we were calculating our tacos, so our total advertising cost of sale, and the way, the way that you can think of that very simply if you're just doing um, back of the, the napkin math is your profit margin of a product minus the A cost. So our A cost range for most of our products is somewhere in the range of 20 to 30% on average, just given the, the gross margin of our products. And so if you have a product that has a 30% margin, uh, which is pretty good, uh, not amazing, but pretty good, and your A cost is... 10%, let's say, which would be a, a very good A cost, then you're then you're going to be looking at on those PPC sales, a profit margin of 20%, but that's not calculating your total sales, organic sales too. So what Tacos does is it brings in the PPC sales and the, uh, the organic sales together and looks at what your advertising dollars are doing as a brand uh, or as a product as a whole. So what, what, we were doing before was calculating our tacos just based on our gross revenue, meaning um, all sales. The problem with that is every brand experiences some level of refunds and returns, right? And so it varies by niche, it varies by brand. Some of our best selling products have a little bit of a higher return rate just to the because of the nature of the products. Nothing like clothing or some of these other ones where this would be an even bigger deal. But the the higher your return rate is, the the more important this would be to do as an exercise or as a practice in your business. We if we have a five to six percent return rate and we're not calculating that in our tacos, um, then at the end of the month when we're doing our financial statement, our profit margin is going to look lower than what we were all month thinking our tacos was at. And so now as of um, last fall, we're really including our returns and refunds more into our tacos calculations. And we're trying to have a, what we would call basically like a true tacos or a net tacos um, of returns and refunds. And, and so I think that's important to look at. And that hurt us a little bit on the margin end where we were basically being unintentionally more aggressive with our PPC than we wanted to be because that tacos was higher than what we wanted. So that, that's a big thing I, I had that, you know, look at your net tacos. Another thing um, with your PPC is just to make sure um, there is a, a net branding effect. This is the harder thing to calculate. But, uh, you know, I often say when we're running ads off Amazon, like Facebook and Google ads, which I don't know, you know, some of our listeners may or may not be at the point where they're doing that. There is this kind of brand halo effect to PPC that is nice, right? A lot of our Shopify sales and Amazon sales, vice versa, the ad the ad dollars we're spending on these different channels have a halo effect where Facebook and Google ad customers are, hey, I only buy stuff on Amazon. So they see our ad and then they go to Amazon and buy. And so it looks like an organic sale, but maybe it's not truly for the brand and um, vice versa. We might have Amazon PPC that they end up later. We you know, get them through our Shopify website because they go and buy there. And so you might want to look at now beyond Amazon a tacos 
or a true ROAS for your brand as a whole? What are you spending on ads both on and off Amazon? And that's something that we weren't intentionally kind of looking as much as we should have the entire brand halo effect and really putting that into a total advertising cost for the whole brand. So th those were two big takeaways we had at the end of last year. And, you know, for me, like as you're explaining all this and, you know, I'm a self-admitted, I'm not a numbers guy, but I do realize how important PPC is. We are in the age of Amazon ads. And so you have to be an expert or you have to hire an agency that are experts with PPC. So we work with a few clients where they're probably more like me. If I didn't have a team, I would say, hey, look, you know, I, I want you to handle that because I'm good at this, right? And so whatever you're good at, if PPC is not your thing, you know, the, the big takeaway from this when your brand gets to a certain level, you absolutely have to pay attention and you have to know how the various ways to run those Amazon ads. It is going to dramatically affect what your net margin is going to be, correct? Yeah. And, and, you know, the third option would be to hire it in house, like you're saying. Um, but the, the difficulty of hiring someone in house, if you don't know what you're doing is it's, it's really hard to train them. And so they might, so then you look for someone who already has experience, but they might not run PPC the way that you wanted it to be done. Right. So at this point, uh, we have some really good in-house, uh, brand managers and PPC, uh, managers, but it, it took really us knowing PBC and having years of experience to really help get our team to the point where we feel confident letting them run most of the day, day to day on the PPC end. And we really more look at on our Wednesday financial calls we do every week, we get together with our brand manager, Ken, and he goes through what our ACOS is for our top SKUs, what our tacos is, are we in line? Here's the goal we had for the month, the quarter, um, seasonally what we're looking at. And so that's what we're looking at, kind of the higher level picture now, as long as the numbers are hitting in. Before we move on to other margin considerations, I did wanna hit again, um, we're throwing out there like generalization numbers. But something to always remember is that every product goes through a product life cycle. So when you first bring a new product in, we're not concerned so much with having a 20 or 30% ACOS or a 10 or a 15% tacos. We just want to launch. We just want to sell the, the product. And so in the beginning, we have a tacos that might go all the way up to the margin of the product. So if it's a 30 or 40% margin product, we'll, we'll be okay with the tacos of 40, even higher sometimes, because if you think about what you were saying before, Andy, in, in the old days, we did more giveaways and giveaways are still a thing, but you know, more giveaways. And we were literally giving away products for free. So those are just a marketing expense. So if you consider your PPC as another way to, to generate sales, which it is in the beginning, then, you know, if you go all the way up to a 100% ACOS, a 100% ACOS of a, of a new SKU would essentially be like giving that product away for free. Um, in a way it's not, it's not exactly because of some of the fees, but, uh, you know, if, if you sell it for a hundred dollars and you spend a hundred dollars to make that sale, it's like you're paying to give that product away at first just to generate that sale and revenue. Now, obviously you, you don't want to do that forever. So after your first um, 30 days after the first 90 days, you're probably moving through these different phases of the product life cycle until you get, you go from this launch mode to this, maybe a little bit less aggressive mode to then this maintenance mode eventually where you do want to settle into that tacos that you think is going to be good long-term. And one thing I think some people make the mistake of is you really get married to your product. You get so excited about it. And so you go through the launch mode and, and months and months and months go by and you're still spending you still have a really high ACOS tacos and you're just keeping it there just for the sake of the sales. At some point, you, once you've done everything you can, you do have to say to yourself like, Hey, maybe, maybe the PVC is just not even going to ever work. And this product just like, isn't going to be a winner for me. Uh, Andy, I remember a retreat that we did years ago now where you, you gave the advice to a seller who was spending thousands of dollars a month on PPC, you, you basically told them at the end, like, whoa, this product's never going to work out. It's like a saturated product. And do, do you remember what the, this advice that you gave to that person? Yeah. So I, th I think for, for this discussion, it leads into probably what the next step is for brands to take to increase their margin is they have to cut their losers. Uh, you can't keep throwing money at products that are losers. And we've experienced this a number of times, just like you said, through the life cycle of a product, 
you know, whenever you bring a product to Amazon, obviously you're not thinking that this is going to be a loser product. You put a lot of work into it. So you're hoping that it's going to be a double, a triple, or even a home run. But the reality is every two out of five products is successful. And so you're going to reorder those products. The other three, you have to figure out, you know, sometimes it might be in the middle, but you have to make those decisions. And oftentimes, like you just said, folks are married to their product, they become emotional, and so they're still continuing to throw money through advertising, and the product is just not getting any traction. So that's when you have to make that decision, right? As a company, you know, the, 10, the bottom 10% of these products, we're not gonna reorder, we are gonna dial down our PPC so we're not bleeding money away, and we are going to sell through the inventory you know, I think on some of our products, we actually made that decision. We have around $30,000 worth of inventory, but we said, hey, look, we're going to shut off. We've been very aggressive with PPC. We're going to drip PPC uh, our advertising. We're going to raise our price because now it's instead of selling through this product in four months, we're looking at a 12 to 14 month time. But that's OK, because our margin is going to be better. We have the space. It's just sitting in our warehouse, merchant fulfilled. And sometimes you got to make those type of decisions, right? Yeah. And, and just to, you know, say that's because, like you said, we have the space, the cash flow is okay for us. So most people are probably not going to want to sit on a product that long. And the advice you gave to this seller back at our retreat, I remember you said, hey, this product's not good. You need to drop your price. So the opposite, you said you need to drop your price and essentially liquidate this. And they dropped it a couple bucks down. And it was a cheap product, $20 maybe. And they were able to sell through relatively quickly at that point. And if they would have kept the price higher and done the PPC, they definitely would have been at a net negative at the end, much more than what they ended up. So so sometimes you have to drop your price and liquidate. And sometimes you got to raise your price and hold. You know, it, it depends what your situation is. But at the and end if of the day, you the margin. If it's Amazon FBA and it's at the warehouse, then you're absolutely dropping your price, right? Because yeah. you're paying those storage fees. Yeah, if it's a loser and it's been there too long, for sure. So, yeah, so I think that's always a good discussion to keep in mind, like, hey, you know, the 80-20 rule, not every product's going to be good. And we probably had 20 products we launched last year that we just didn't reorder and aren't selling and ended up losing some money, but not a ton of money. Like, it was investment, um, you know, testing costs. And then we had another 50 products we launched last year plus that are doing really good and they're going to be big sellers this year. So it's it's you just got to keep that mindset there. Maybe someone listening here wins on every single product. Congrats to you. That has not been our experience. We are not that good at picking. And so just be aware that you're going to have losers in the mix. Uh, all right. I want to talk about another um, margin increaser you could look at, and that is LTL palletizing. So if you aren't sending products right to Amazon, if you utilize a 3PL you might, and you have the quantities and in, in the volume there, look at LTL palletizing, something we, we've... Um, not done a good enough job on partially because a lot of times like the last couple of years we've been running out of stock so fast so many times we just like are typically sending products in as quick as we can and small parcel delivery is is typically the fastest way to get stuff in if you're in a rush but if you have the time if you can forecast if you can look out a couple months in your expected inventory demand a, a really good move can be ltl palletizing stuff in which is super obvious to some people who are always doing that but some of you listening may not consider LTL all the time. And so if you know, you know, your anticipated March or April sales demand, you might want to send in a month early your, you know, your palletized amount that you expect for the whole month, maybe even two months. And even if you pay slightly more in storage at some point, because you're sending more in bulk, one, it's easier from a forecasting demand to kind of do that Two, your, your inventory there is likely to have um, a, you're less likely to go out of stock again if you're not over sending it in because you have it there and you're not sending in as, as many small batches of shipment. So um, for some of our products, we've found a 30% reduction in shipping costs due to LTL palletizing into Amazon versus the small parcel delivery with UPS or FedEx. So something to consider there, that could be a real um, margin booster right there. Something we always talk about when you are in the product development phase is to look at the packaging dimensions and weight of yours. This is kind of well known, but if you are right on the cusp of going from small to um, to to large or from uh, small oversized and oversized to medium oversized and medium to large, if you're right on that edge, making a 
inch or half inch or a pound difference could could uh, save you a ton of money. So Andy, we actually have several products that we purposely worked with the manufacturer where we knew we needed to get it right under 40, uh, right under 50 pounds, right? Because when you go over 50 pounds and you're doing especially Merchant Fulfill, which we do for these larger items, uh, UPS or FedEx will hit you with this surcharge of extra heavy packages, right? So we we had to literally like fight with our supplier to get like, I can't even remember everything. There was like these little slats in the box we took out. We were like making sure they measured it on the scale. And, and so it's a, it's a really big deal because it could be 10% margin per product at the end of the day. Yeah, no, that that's huge. That's something that, you know, if you're a sole proprietor, you have to spend time on that and you have to get that packaging, those dimensions and weights correct because it can make a huge difference on your overall net margin. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things I just want to kind of end this section about would be saying you, if you're the biggest thing you could be doing, if you're not doing it is just really deep diving into your financials every month. Again, it's not the most sexy or fun thing, like you were saying, Andy, but if you are not currently make sure that you are having a monthly true financial snapshot, hopefully you are using some kind of QuickBooks or zero accounting platform that's getting all of your numbers together. And you're really looking at that and just know what your margin is at the end of the month. Most sellers margin is lower than if, if you were just to guess what your margin is, usually you're guessing higher than what it actually is. Okay. So if you're just guessing, you're like I'm at 20%, but you're not actually having a financial snapshot, you're probably lower than that. Okay. So just let's, let's just be honest with ourselves. And, and last year at the end of the year, we kind of started creeping into that. Hey, we think we're like our revenue is staying strong, but our margins were, were going down. A lot of it was due to the increased shipping costs from China all last year that just kept creeping up. And then we're on a, um, a FIFO basis for our inventory. So first in, first out. And so it, there was a couple month delay. So like the shipping containers started going up 10, 15, $20,000 cost. But even after that lands, the, the inventory that keeps selling is on the FIFO basis. So that was cheaper landed inventory. And then as the months go by, you start dipping into that more expensive landed cost inventory because the shipping was going up. So there's this delay effect. And I think a lot of Amazon sellers are just now in 2022 feeling some of the delayed increase of cost effect from 2021. And so all of a sudden their margins keep going down. Their, 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 or their costs keep going up on a FIFO basis. Their margins keep going down because like their PPC costs keep going up too and everything. And and now all of a sudden you get in this little bit of a panic mode. You're like, man, what do I need to do? And and this is where, you know, I don't th this is the part I don't like. We we talked about some of the like kind of, you know, PPC, all that, but there's other like harder decisions when it comes to your margins. And sometimes that's like, hey, where is some of the overhead fat built up in my business? It might be some of these duplicate kind of um, um, programs or tools that I've built up that I'm not really using anymore. It could be team members that aren't adding the value that I thought they would be. And that's kind of adding to my overhead. It could be extra storage or marketing dollars, non PPC or whatever that I'm adding here. And, and those are the harder decisions, right, Andy? Yeah, absolutely. So just to recap, if you want better margins, you have to look at three main areas right now. Don't delay, put off, you know, do, it's always the hard stuff. A lot of times when people put off, you need to check your PPC. You need to make sure you have a good strategy, understand the tacos, a cost. You need to make sure that you understand the packaging of your product. And if it can be reduced, right, that's a very easy way that you can increase your margins from that. You need to make sure you cut your losers. Don't keep spending money on products that are bleeding away your margin. Even if you really like the product, if you're emotionally connected, you have to get away from them make a strategy so that you can increase that net margin. To me, those are the three main areas that people can take away and, and take action on like right now. Yeah. And if I could add a fourth, it would just be review your, your financial statements every month. Make sure you know that true margin at the end of the month and uh, get your accounting in order because that's, that's the biggest issue. I think for a lot of sellers, they get behind them. It, it, it sucks. You hate doing it. And then you're just operating blindly. And if you, if you're operating blindly, it, it's going to, it's going to come back to bite you later down the road. All right, Andy, talk, talk to me about, um, 
Amazon seller tribe. We just closed up tribe seven coaching is or the enrollment of it. And we're getting into it. But talk to me about our Amazon tribe member, Brandy, and how exciting that is. Brandy was in the tribe at 13 and crushing it with arbitrage and cutting deals and, and going hard. Just talk to, talk to me about how exciting that is. It still blows my mind. You know, we started nine years ago, so 2013, selling arbitrage by going to thrift stores, going to big box stores like Toys R Us, Walmart, Target, and then reselling those products on Amazon. So that was nine years ago. And today, sellers are doing the exact same thing. And Nate and I, we often tell people, look, if you want to learn the Amazon ecosystem, there's no better way to learn it than through arbitrage. And that's what Brandy has done. So Brandy's family, they actually live on the border in Texas to Mexico. Her father owns a ranch there thousands of acres. And so he actually can't shop. He has to stay right there to protect their ranch. Uh, they're, they're dealing with so many issues down there. And so Brandy and her mom, again, Brandy is now 15, but she was 14 when her and her mom hit a million dollars in sales. So again, picture this, a 14 year old uh, girl, she is homeschooled and her and her mom, they have to actually drive two hours to some of the closest stores where they can make these products. And she, not only are they purchasing, right, making great buys, but she'll negotiate with the managers of these stores and, uh, and so to me, Nate, I'm just always amazed. You know, we have a number of senior citizens that are in our Amazon seller tribe that are selling a million dollars a year. And then we have now she's 15, but she was 14 years old when her and her mom hit over a million dollars in sales, basically doing the exact same thing that you and I did when we started nine years ago. And I guess, you know, the whole thing is it's never going to go away. Buying low, selling high has been going on forever. It just makes it a little easier now that we can make these sales and these merchant transactions online through these amazing platforms like Amazon. I was talking to Brandy and her mom in your house back in our meetup in August, and, and they were telling me this story. They were at a store Brandy goes to, uh, actually her mom was trying to shop, couldn't find the deals they wanted and they were about to leave. And Brandy said, mom, we're not leaving until, until we get something special here. She goes into the store, talks to the manager and negotiates down inventory that they're going to be buying by a couple of thousand dollars and literally saved them thousands of dollars. And she was only 14, 13, 14 at the time. Can you imagine that being 14, 15 now, I think she is, and she's doing those kind of deals. She, she's negotiating with managers. When I was 14, 15, no way I'm, I'm, I wasn't even like working that hard, right? But no way I'm negotiating deals with managers and being confident enough to do that. Can you imagine where she's going to be in another 10 years where she's experienced million dollar selling success at the age of 14? Uh, what that's going to do to her confidence level as a, you know, we, we, Andy, we talk about a lot about the, the beauty of Amazon. It can be run as like a family business, like a true you know, old school mom and pop family business. You you hear people like Gary Vee talk about how he grew up working in the business and kind of like cut his teeth in business doing that. Well, there, some of that kind of went away. It seems like at times when with like a corporate culture where obviously you're not bringing your kids to work. So this small entrepreneurship where the, it could be a family business, uh, Brandy's in there. She's working just as hard as her mom is a lot of days, um, by choice. Like she likes to do this too. Right. So you have to have that entrepreneur mindset even as young, but I just can't imagine where she's going to be in 10 years. It's going to be super exciting to see where she goes with that, takes her business knowledge. And I'm just always thankful the Amazon opportunity gives these families a way to be at home more and to actually like have real life experience that you're not going to get in school. You're not going to learn how to create a million dollar business going to school, right? No, this is, and I think this is one of the reasons why we created the Amazon seller tribe. We saw that there was abundance out there. And even though we sell on Amazon, we know that there are literally millions of products, right? That you can sell uh, on Amazon, similar, you know, again, to what you see in big box stores and the opportunity really is endless. So, you know, Home Depot, their tagline is they want to be the endless aisle when it comes to e-commerce. Well, Amazon is basically already that today. And so a 14 year old girl, a senior citizen, right? Who wants to create a side hustle and maybe even turn it into a full-time hustle. 
that is always going to be there. The word that we use a lot is arbitrage. There is always going to be opportunity for you to buy a product at a low price based on supply and demand, and then potentially sell that product for a very profitable, higher price. Business been around forever. Amazon is just dialing it in and definitely making it a lot easier again for folks. And I'll say this, it gives me hope. So a lot of times older adults, they like to kind of um, bag on younger kids like, oh man, this generation, all oh, these millennials. Well, I'm excited to say like we have some absolute phenoms in the Amazon seller tribe, 14, 21, 22, who are crushing it. By, by doing retail and online arbitrage. Yeah, and you know, millennials is starting to get kind of old because I'm on the I'm on the young end of millennials. So we're actually we're actually past millennials now when we Gen Z or whatever it is for these next guys. So millennial Exciting. boomers it'll all just be used as is slang here soon. Hey, I want to wrap up with uh, AMZ Pro. Shout out to our team at amzprofessional.com. We had a brand new seller sign up last week. This seems to happen every week, but this person got three thousand one hundred and twenty dollars back in their first week of being an AMZ Pro customer. And I know we just talked about this last week, but Andy, if that person would have went to one of these uh, reimbursement services for Amazon sellers that charges a 25% commission on recovered money, that would have been $780 they would have paid of their own money, right? Like this is already their money. It's not like they're discovering money that is out of thin air. It's your money that Amazon's holding. They would have paid 780 in the first week. Obviously, AMZ Pro, a fraction of that. So I just want to give a shout out to our team. Uh, our team at AMZ Pro works super hard. Uh, we're passionate about helping sellers be successful, get money back from them. Uh, that's really, the, we started AMZ Pro because we saw the need in our own business. Then I started helping you with it. Then we started helping some of our friends in the community. And then it grew into uh, a, a real need in the Amazon community. And that's why we've been doing this for over five, six years now. Uh, but every week when I see these signups and I get the numbers they come through of, of I always see um, people's first week of reimbursements that I get because to me, that's kind of the exciting you know first week and see that. Uh, it's, it's really encouraging to see the hard work of our team. It's encouraging to see people get money back uh, that they are owed to them that they can put back into their business and grow. And it's a little bit discouraging to think about the 25% commission that people would be paying if you're using one of these services out there that charge 25%. Yeah, so let me just go in a little deeper on this because I get really passionate about this. I made a LinkedIn post a few weeks ago and got a little blowback from some of these agencies. If you're using an agency that is charging you 25%, this is what I put in my post, those are like loan shark rates. You would never go to the bank and sign your name on a 25% loan. You absolutely would not do it. And so the blowback from some of them was, well, you know what? You get what you pay for. So they basically were saying, hey, look, these companies you know, that charge 25%, they do a better job. And that's an absolute lie. The, the truth is, across the board, you're gonna see an average of about 1.8 to 2.4% in your reimbursements. So if you're a million dollar seller, that's going to equal out to be, you're going to, over the year, you're going to get about $20,000 of reimbursements from Amazon by opening up these type of cases. That's across the board. It's a 2%. So don't believe the lie that these companies tell you, oh, hey, look, you know, it's a beneficial. That's not the truth. And that's also why... Nate, now we've never paid for advertising for our service. It's always been word of mouth. Amazon Pro is word of mouth uh, um, agency. We work with over 250 sellers. And again, our average is 2%, very similar to what these other agencies are doing. So if you're a million dollar seller, you should be getting about $20,000 in reimbursements back. If you use an agency that charges 25%, that means they're going to take $4,000 of your money. If you use Amazon Pro, we charge $1,100 for the year. So that is extremely significant savings. And obviously, the bigger seller you are, the more money that you're going to be giving what I call these loan shark agencies that do the very exact same thing that we do at a fraction of the cost. So that's my pitch. You know, I don't usually talk about it, but, but after that post and after getting blowback from some of these guys, I, I want to go after them, Nate, because I think that they are charging a unfair rate to Amazon sellers. Not to belabor this point too much, but one other thing I would say is that 
a lot of times Amazon will reimburse you for certain things. They're just slow on it. So that number you're throwing out there of 20,000, Andy, is definitely true. And, and some of these other services out there might proactively get some of the reimbursement back and, and then charge the fee on it that Amazon was already going to get you back anyways. And so then it, it kind of double hurts. Like you are already going to get this money back without using any service, some of it, a portion of it. They're taking their 25% of money that was like already coming to you. It was just a little bit slow from Amazon. And that's why I don't like that commission model because it's, you know, that whole you get what you pay for. No, in fact, you might be getting less than what you pay for because uh, because of that, what I just was talking about, where when AMZ Pro, AMZ Professional is a flat rate, yeah, we might get the money back sooner than Amazon was going to give you. And all that does is add value to you because we're not taking a commission from it. So that's my last point is that some of the money you might be paying to those commission-based services might have been money that was already heading back to you. Then all of a sudden you got 25% taken out um, on the way uh, to your bank. So yeah, that's my last thing. Uh, I want to remind everybody to check out our brand new magazine. Uh, we're so excited about it. We just want to get that. At least take a look at it before you judge whether a magazine sounds dumb. It's it's digital. Uh, and you know even if you don't re read magazines, there's a lot of great info in there. Uh, and just check it out just because we're, we're proud of it and it looks cool. So amazingfreedom.com. Sign up to be an Amazing Freedom Insider. You'll get that magazine. You'll get our weekly newsletter. And you'll get our monthly blog updates and more uh, tools as we develop them that we're using in our business and release them. So we appreciate it. All right. Andy, I think that'll do it for today. Thanks, guys. If you're listening, become an insider. Uh, share this podcast with someone who needs to become a better Amazon seller. And we'll see you for the next episode of, of the Amazing Freedom Amazon Seller Podcast. Thanks, guys. See you.